Let's take a look now at the input resistance of two of our common operational amplifier configurations, the non-inverting and the inverting. You'll recall from our discussion of just the generic amplifiers that in general we have a source, re a source with a source resistor that we want to amplify and that then is connected to the input resistance and to the output, if this is V in, the output is some scaled A V zero times V in. So between the source resistance of the source and the input, and re input resistance of the amplifier, we've got a voltage divider. And in order to main, make it so that this voltage here is a significant portion of this, we want the input resistance here to be significantly larger than the source resistance. In fact, ideally, this input resistance would be infinite. So what we want to look at is what are the input resistances that these sources see in both the non-inverting and the inverting configuration. Well, our input is just equal to the input voltage divided by the input current. Now in this case, V2 is our input source, our signal, and we haven't shown a resistance, but there could very well be, and, and in all likelihood there is a source resistance associated with it. But because the current, or because this terminal is connected, or this uh, source is connected directly to the non-inverting terminal that has, in the ideal case, an infinite input resistance, the current going in, I in, is going to equal zero. So for the non-inverting configuration, we have R in is equal to V in, which is just V2, divided by I in, which is zero. So the input resistance for the non-inverting amplifier is infinite. And when it comes to this type of a voltage division, the voltage across the input resistance will be equal to the signal voltage because there's no current flowing between them. Now, let's determine the input resistance for the inverting amplifier. We're going to see that it's not nearly as satisfying as this infinite resistance on the non-inverting. Once again, we have the voltage V in, which in this case is V1. And we have a current flowing from the source into the amplifier, calling that I in. But because this doesn't go directly and solely into the inverting terminal, because there's this path, I in is not zero. Rather, I in is equal to V in, or V1, if you will, divided by R1. So R in is equal to the input voltage, which is V1, divided by I in. Well, this then is equal to V1 divided by I in, which is V1 divided by R1. Well, dividing by a fraction, you invert and multiply, the V1s cancel. And we see that the input resistance is simply R1, whatever the value of that resistor is there. Well, what's the problem with that? In order to make the input resistance to the inverting amplifier large, where the input resistance is just R1, we'd have to make R1 large. If we wanted to say to be on the order of a mega ohm, we'd have to make R1 be one mega ohm. Well, that in and of itself isn't a problem. Where does the problem come from? Well, the problem comes from that the gain, the closed loop gain of this amplifier is equal to a negative R2 over R1 times V1. So if we want to get any gain at all out of this thing, R2 has got to be bigger than R1. Well, if R1 is one mega ohm and we want to gain a five, R2 is going to have to be five mega ohms. Well, that represents a couple of problems. First of all, it's tough to get highly precise, big resistances. But the other problem is that when we start having resistors around here on the order of mega ohms, the current flowing through here is so small. After all, that's what we were trying to get it to be. We want that current to be small, so we made these resistances large. The problem is, as we have said before, 
the current going into the terminals of the op amp is really small, but it's not zero. In fact, the currents coming into the op amp might be on the order of a few tenths of a microamp. Now, if these are mega ohm resistances, this current here is also going to be on the order of microamps or tenths of microamps. And all of a sudden, the current here is no longer significantly larger than the current here so that we can just ignore this. Let's state it the other way. No longer is this current here going into the inverting terminal amplifier, no longer is it so much smaller than the other ones around it, the other currents around it, that we can just neglect it. So at some point, these resistances cause such small currents that this current and this current are going to be on the same order and we can no longer ignore that current. One of the inherent weaknesses of the inverting amplifier as it's drawn here is that it has a relatively small input resistance. There are some tricks that you can do, we'll talk about them in class, but there's tricks that you can do to increase the effective input resistance seen by the source.